Hello, you're listening to KRUI in Iowa City, 89.7 on the radio, streaming online at krui.fm. We're getting a late start. My name is Justin Comer. This show is called I Hear, I See. It's about local music and local art and local musicians and local artists. Uh, Before I get too far into this, I want to let you know we have a free concert coming up Saturday, December 1st at 8 p.m., at the Trumpet Blossom Cafe. That'll feature performances by Vero Rose Smith, The Demon Possessed, Shakes, Will Yeager, and Annika Kildegard. It's going to be a good time. I'm going to be there. I have to run the show. (laughs) All right. So let's get into today's show. I have a special guest. I mentioned the show is about local artists, local musicians, and I have one of those in the studio with me today. Please welcome to I Hear I See, Dr. Jonathan Wilson. Thank you, Justin, and hello, everybody out there. Uh, Just before we begin, I am hoping my mom is listening to the radio right now. I just wanted to shout out to her and say happy birthday. (laughs) Um, I love you and hope everything is going well where you are. And a shout out to my dad and my sister, Rachel. Awesome. Happy birthday to John's mom. (laughs) So, John, uh, who are you? What do you do? I'm an artist. I am, am a composer, and I am also um, do a number of other things besides <laughs> uh, write music. Cool. We can get more specific later, but let's talk about uh, your compositions, because that's how we met. Uh, you got your Correct. doctorate here at the University of Iowa, which yes, you I, completed in the spring of this year, if I remember right. <laughs> I graduated in December last year. Okay, December so I was, I was off by a couple months. No, not, not too bad. <laughs> not much. Yeah, so so you uh, you got your degree in uh, in composition of music. That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I uh, you know I came in August two thousand thirteen, and I spent about five years total. Um, well, technically it's four and a half years. But <laughs> we'll yeah. just round and say about five. That'll be pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you started uh, the second year of my master's, so we overlapped a little bit, and that's how we got to know each other. Yeah, we met at. David Gomper's house. I remember we. Um, that was when he used to host those uh, parties at his house. That's right. We did. We met at his house. <laughs> yeah, you were uh, you were grilling the hamburgers and the cheeseburgers in the back. I was grilling something. Yeah, I don't remember exactly <laughs> what was going on. I think it was burgers. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we had burgers. I I was not a very uh, experienced grill cook at the time, so I was a little nervous about it, but. I don't think anyone got sick, so I think <laughs> I think I did it okay. I didn't die, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I I do want to play some of your music. Oh, of course. I think we yeah. should we should do that like pretty pretty soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. Uh, and you said you wanted to prioritize this piece called "Ghosts Before Breakfast." Correct. So that was the piece that I wrote in uh, upon graduating from uh, University of Iowa. This was my piece that we call the dissertation okay this is your dissertation i see that's correct so okay. ghost before breakfast is uh, it's a piece that's for uh kind of a chamber orchestra or sinfonietta size mm-hmm. um and with electronics and the electronics in the piece they are two channel fixed media electronics which means that the electronics have already been recorded and composed manipulated beforehand right so you're not doing like live electronic performance it's uh it's pre predetermined pre-recorded the only live aspect of um executing the electronics is coming from the mixer just bringing up the faders for the volume and you know making on the fly adjustments if needed Okay, but that's that's more of a. But yeah, that's production. more uh, that's more of a technical aspect. Yeah, not not, not, not so much performance. A, a performative aspect. Of okay, yeah. Is there anything you want to to say to introduce this piece before we get into it, or should I just start playing it? Well, I think we should just uh, jump right into it. Okay, so this is about fifteen minutes long, so we will listen to it in its entirety and then discuss. Hope you'll enjoy it. And I should. Uh, who performed this? So the. This was performed under the direction of uh, Zachary Stanton. Uh, he teaches at the University of Iowa, and mm-hmm. uh, this was performed by the University of Iowa Center for New Music. Great. All right, so here is a recording of the University of Iowa Center for New Music performing the Jonathan Wilson composition, Ghosts Before Breakfast. Mm-hmm. 
That was Ghosts Before Breakfast, composed by Jonathan Wilson and performed by the University of Iowa Center for New Music. And I want to discuss this piece in detail with Jonathan, who I have in the studio with me. But before I get to that, it's time for the obligatory weather report. So current time is 4.34 p.m. Current temperature is 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Feels like 20 degrees Fahrenheit. We've got 0% precipitation and 65% humidity with four mile per hour winds coming from the southwest. Skies are clear currently. Any other uh, weather events I should report? Do you see anything outside, John? I see snow and clear skies outside. Mm -hmm. The snow's already on the ground, though. It's not even that high at all. It's only about There's barely, an inch or, yeah. or less. Just a light dusting. <laughs> Pretty much, yes. All right, so uh, I have one very uh, superficial and shallow question for you about this piece. <laughs> How uh, superficial <laughs> is it? Uh, where does the title Ghost Before Breakfast come from? It comes from the 1928 German film, uh, which is uh, the English translation for it is Ghost Before Breakfast. Ah, okay. I'm not familiar with this film. Um, it was one of those things that in terms of finding a title for this piece um, was something that took quite a while to figure out in terms of uh, what it was going to be. But when I finally landed on Ghost Before Breakfast, I think it really hit on the main premise that I find most important with this piece, which is that we are tangling with ideas that are floating in our minds. So Ghost Before Breakfast for me is a metaphor for the phantoms, that, a.k.a. musical ideas that we are searching for and trying to put into concretion, meaning on paper or on a computer software program, into notes. So that for me is the okay. breakfast. That's okay. the meal. Okay, so... <laughs> so the title came when you were already done it composing came, the piece? The title came after. Totally after. You were done. Oh, yes. Right. Um, well, not almost. I mean, not completely done, but it was... But pretty much. I was pretty much done when I okay. um, had come up with it. So that, that refers to the the process of taking a musical idea from, from your mind and putting it like on paper, transmitting it to someone else. That's a good way of uh, <laughs> of describing it as well. Yeah, yeah. and the way the way that I think about that actually is that the musical idea that you have in here is maybe the notation is actually an abstraction of that. Like the the idea itself is what's like material, even though you can't express it very well. Yeah, and then the notation is an abstraction of that thought. Yeah, I mean, even uh, thinking of you know, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, you know, <laughs> when the Egyptian scribes would put down symbols to record past events or transactions, you know, they would use symbols mm -hmm. which translate uh, in some fashion or another to an idea or concept. I mean, even just those images right. are really abstractions of actual thoughts or statements you know so. yeah and it's a, it's a similar concept i have the score for your piece right here in front of me and mm -hmm. and the hieroglyphics representing a real idea in the real world is similar to say this circle on a line above these other lines <laughs> that's that's a symbolic representation of of a certain sound yeah i'll i will say though um before today though i never associated my own music with ancient egyptian hieroglyphics <laughs> yeah yeah things happen when you're doing live radio yeah, <laughs> ideas I mean, come all to the you uh, all the new images come into the foreground <laughs> yeah so how long were you working on this before oh, before that recording? that was quite a while that i started this really my second year in the composition program i was studying with david gomper at the time mm -hmm. so that and was that's when we came up with first uh the medium for the pieces um one of my lessons one day, I was with David, mm -hmm. and this was back when we were um, in the, really the the shopping mall, 
Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. University before, Capital Center before, before we the, new the new Voxman was open. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we just we decided on you know a a, cha- a sinfonietta piece, um, simply because I had written an orchestra piece before that that was performed back in 2012, and um, just the difficulty of writing something for a chamber opera and actually getting that performed. Mm-hmm. I mean, those were my other choices, but that's what I eventually settled on because um, I wanted to take on something that was uh, smaller than an orchestra, but larger than something that would have been, um, uh, you know, a little, you know, quintet or sextet or sure. septet yeah. or something like so that. It's a, it's a larger chamber ensemble, but it's a uh, small enough that you could get it performed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the piece... It went through a lot of changes over the years because, I mean, it took me about two, I think two and a half years, really, before I finally uh, got the final draft of it, Mm -hmm. really. I mean, the the version that you heard today, I mean, that took me about two and a half years. Yeah. And that performance was uh, back in February Mm -hmm. when we had the Iowa Composers Forum concert, which was held at the Foxman Music Building. So that was a live performance? Yep. So that was nice. a live music performance um, with the Center for New Music. Um, so there's a lot of things in there that go on. And you look like you're begging to ask a question. Oh, uh, I, my next question was going to be about the, the electronics. I don't know that I have a question per se, but uh, it sounds like the... The electronics are very tastefully inserted in the ensemble. <laughs> it sounds like they, they blend really well with what's happening with the acoustic instruments. That was intentional. The key mm-hmm. word for the relationship between the acoustic ensemble and the electronics is integration. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is um, it's very difficult, I think, a lot of times to find ways to get um, the sounds of the electronics, which have their own timbres, their own colors, their own world, to coexist with the acoustic ensembles that we are so used to hearing mm-hmm. as conventional audiences. Um, well, actually, I mean, these days, you know, the youngest generation, I don't, I'm not sure it's probably more, they're more used to the electronics than the acoustics. But, yeah, your average person's but probably I, I will say this. Um, so the electronics... Yeah. Um, the way that I used those um, was to kind of gradually insert them into the ensemble so that they kind of blended into one organism. Mm-hmm. So th- when you first hear the electronics, they're all by themselves. The electronics, you just hear all these instruments coming in and going, <laughs> you know, you have all these different uh, virtuosic like sounds going on. I mean, you get nothing on the ensemble whatsoever. Of course, in this recording, because the speakers are so far back, uh, you know, it, it seems like it's out, out somewhere in the distance. It's like it's <laughs> uh, from another world someplace. Um, but uh, incidentally, those sounds were recorded actually from the first reading oh cool with the cnm plus um, a recording session that um that was done at the electronic music studios um with uh three people who did recordings with flute clarinet and actually a bass saxophone in there as well oh very cool and so then uh the relationship there is just you know the instrumentation the rhythmic complexity and uh, just this uh, cha- this chaos that's going on because of all this uh, hyper rapid interactivity that's going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when it comes in the second time and third times, both times they start to get slightly integrated into the ensemble. I mean, they have moments where they're by themselves, but um, we start getting some integration. Mm-hmm. And those were mostly. Uh, uh, symbol sounds that I would copy, paste, transpose, and pitch shift to get uh, you know these very vast colors of inharmonic sounds. Um, so they don't quite blend in exactly in terms of being sounds that are harmonic. Sure. Sounds that you know if you you know if you played a C, 
you know, in one instrument you had an E in another, you know, it may not blend sure. because of the, uh, the, the spectrum right, of right. that sound that I'm working with, the cymbal. Right. Um, and then the fourth time when it finally comes in, I actually have a completely different source. I don't have a source that's from the acoustic world. It's now electronic. Right. But the odd thing is that the electronic sound you're hearing has something of a harmonic sound to it. Um, and that is actually a Moog synthesizer um, oh, that was good. combined with a, um, an analog spring reverb unit, um, which, uh, you know, had a very, you know, a, a, I think one of the best ways I think you can end a piece, uh, just this kind of high wail that <laughs> fades out into the distance and dies away. Um, yeah, it but fits the, the piece very the well. The cool part of that is at that spot at the end, um, the way I composed that final section with that synthesizer was actually the synthesizer came first, and then I record. Then I uh, was playing around with um, on the piano with while playing back the electronics and trying to get all different kinds of sounds with that, um, or different chords, I should say. Mm -hmm. And then once I found the kind of chords that I wanted to use, then it became clear to me how I wanted the end to unfold. Very good. All right, so we got a good look at your some of your process for that. Oh, yeah. Because it took place over two and a half years, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot more we could discuss there. Oh, there'd be, oh, boy. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff <laughs> yeah so i need to play a grant spot real quick um, oh, okay sure. after that i would like to maybe discuss some of your non-musical creative activities sure if you're up for it okay so here's a grant spot and then we'll get back to talking support for krui is provided by little village little village is iowa city's independent community supported news and culture publication Little Village's event calendar connects readers with critical cultural opportunities. Through journalism, essays, and events, Little Village works to improve our community according to core values, affordability and access, economic and labor justice, environmental sustainability, racial justice, gender equity, quality health care, quality education, and critical culture. Little Village can be found in print editions at local businesses in Iowa City as well as online at littlevillagemag.com. And we are back. If you're just tuning in, this is I Hear, I See Radio. Today we're talking with composer and creative and creative person in general, uh, Jonathan Wilson. Uh, we just listened to his uh, dissertation titled Ghosts Before Breakfast, and we discussed that a little bit. And uh, now I, I was going to steer the conversation towards his non-musical creative activities. Yeah, so I have some other interests outside of uh, composition, music, mm -hmm. although if someone were to ask me on the street, well, how would you identify yourself? I certainly would say primarily composer, but I would also add that I have other informed tastes that I think um, are a part of my music and blend into other aspects of my sort of creative thinking. So I do some writing, I do some poetry, I do a little theater. Um, you know, a whole bunch of stuff in there. Yeah. When you say theater, uh, have you acted before? Not really. Okay. Um, so but I have that. often been quite fascinated by it. Yeah. So I would, you know. You're talking more like a playwright kind of situation. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So I've actually, um, I mean, my first production I wrote is actually older than the first real piece of music that I wrote. I mean, the first piece of music I wrote, that was in 2007. And the first writing for the theater I did, I was in high school. Mm -hmm. So you've been a, a writer longer than a composer? Is that yeah, how you feel um, about it? <laughs> I would say yes, that I have. I've actually, you know, well, to be fair, I mean, I started writing and music, you know, about the same year. It was 1996. I actually <laughs> brought my little uh, piano diary that I kept. Oh, you have all that those here years. With you. Yeah. Wow. So. <laughs> Just to kind of go off the side just for a moment, uh, about 22 years ago, it was back in the summer of 96, um, I got interested in music because I, you know, we had a player piano in the basement of our house. Oh, there was awesome. A, um, well, it was, it was a player piano. And the uh, player piano is all mechanical. It's, there's mm -hmm. no 
it's not digital at all. So it's like, you know, pre 1970s. Right. Um, but if there's seen, a, oh, it, sorry, if the listener has seen like a little music box and where they have the metal rolls that sort of trigger the, uh, the notes that are playing a player piano is basically just a bigger version of that. Typically. Yeah, typically. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so it was the summer of 96 and, um, I'd actually had been listening to, it was a role of the Gershwin medley. I can't remember who it was that arranged it. I'd have to go back to the house to see it because I still have it. <laughs> How many uh, of these roles do you have? Oh, we have quite a number. I think about over 20, I think. Nice. Yeah. Um, and of course I heard this and I was pretty young at the time. I, you know, just something came over me. I thought I need to get into music. I want to write music. And so, well, I went up to my mom and asked her, mom, can I get some piano lessons in there? I want to play piano. And she said, you know, sure. I mean, we have a neighbor up the street who can teach you to play piano. And so that's how it started. I actually have from this the first day that I started, which was July 3rd, 96. So you would have been like seven or eight? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, A long time ago. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that was listed on here, practice every day. That was what my <laughs> piano teacher um, told me, Marla Cherry. Nice. That's, that's crazy that you still have that. Yeah, <laughs> I still have it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, something like that's important documentation, you know. So uh, that's why I've held on to it. Yeah, how far does that go? Oh, well... You know, when you're young, your interests taste over, change over time. So within, uh, I want to say about two and a half, three years, I actually, you know, I gravitated towards the saxophone because mm-hmm. then I got into the saxophone and, and I was thinking, well, I love saxophone. I want to play saxophone. Why should I play piano? So I stopped playing piano. And to this day, I still regret the fact that I never kept going with the piano lessons because, you know, I enjoy playing the piano and would like to do more of it uh it's just you know difficult yeah we've got limited time there's only so many things we can do exactly (laughs) so to go on the subject of writing uh which happened about the same time Mm -hmm. um you know i was dwelling over you know you know when did i really you know start writing in particular and this actually goes back to um a story of one day that was the same year my sister, Rachel, um, I remember one day she, you know, was starting to write some short story or something. And she, you know, said, I, you know, I should write something too. And so I did like this little short story that was supposed to be about the mystery of seven golden rings. <laughs> A very video game plot. <laughs> yeah, and it had, yeah. And it had Jimmy Carter in it. And we were supposed to go. <laughs> Wait, how old were you? I was eight. <laughs> and you were writing about Jimmy Carter? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, I was into the presidents at the time. I mean, I knew all the presidents at a young age. Nice. You have the, you have the whole succession memorized? Or did you at the yes. time? Very I cool. I still do. <laughs> and, of course, you know, it keeps adding. Sometimes to the, you know, you know, I, I, I don't want to say more than, you know, what's implied. Maybe people will pick up on you can be totally discussing. honest about your feelings here. oh well as long as you don't use any profanity no I'm, the I'm fcc listening. is listening <laughs> no I, no i had no intention whatsoever to do that um i mean i just i was thinking that in terms of you know you know not every president you know lives up to your expectations yeah i'm not I've, a big fan of most of them so <laughs> well wait a minute you weren't alive for most of them well, that's true, but uh, from from historical record, I'm not a fan of their actions. I think is that fair? <laughs> fair enough. Well, we'll leave it at that for the for the presidents. But um, I mean, yeah. So I did write like little short things, not very long stories. I mean, really, when I first got into writing, it was um, you know when I in the sixth grade when I started writing poetry and mm. started writing for quite a while. And then eventually uh, a couple of years later, then I um, actually got the idea to, you know, get into writing theatrical productions uh, based on high school experiences, really. And did you say you had something produced for the theater? In high no, school? no. Or you just no, completed never, something? No, I mean, if anything, it was only for uh, a school project for a class. Mm-hmm. Mainly it was just like for 
you know, a project for an English class or something like that. But I've never actually had something produced by a theater company or anything like mm-hmm. that. Um, so I've actually written um, over the course of, gosh, I think 10, 15 years, uh, a total of 10 theatrical works, um, including the most recent work that I have done, which is actually the libretto for a chamber opera. Mm-hmm. Um, but first it was written as a kind of theatrical work, and then I started converting it over into a, a libretto. Nice. And that took quite a while. A number of years it took me five years. And you have that, you finished that recently? Um, well, to be honest, I'm still making little changes to it now and then. Yeah. But I mean, the first draft of it, I finished a year ago. Okay, cool. And you plan on turning that into a full-on opera? That's been the ambition for five years. Yeah. I'm still, you know, pushing towards it. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work, yes. Um, but I feel it is something that, you know, given the number of years that I've been committed to it and want, you know, to persevere with it, I want to make something of it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what, what did you bring in today? You have a couple of so writing pieces. So the... Well, one of the pieces that I have been writing for quite a while and I wanted to finish, um, but it's been very difficult to finish, um, so it's technically still a work in progress, is, mm-hmm. uh, is an, it would be my first novel if it ever actually gets finished. Um, basically, it's called Dreams of Chains. Dreams of Chains. Dreams of Chains, yeah. Mm-hmm. So basically, um, the title comes from... Um, when you interpret dreams with chains in them, that they have a kind of suggestive meaning about that you're bound to something that you can't let go of. Right. So there's some uh, dream interpretation theory here. (laughs) Through the title, which I think is tied into the essence of what the novel is about. It's about Mm -hmm. the novel concerns two characters who are commonly tied to some kind of... Uh, feeling in the past that they cannot escape from and cannot break from. Right, right. So basically, it's the fact that they can't find relationships or get committed into a relationship and because of demons in their past that they can't let go of. I see. And how long have you been working on this, did you say? Five years. Five years, okay. And you have an excerpt here? Um, A little bit of it. It's one of the more recent bits of it that I wrote within the past couple of months. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the characters is uh, Regina, who is an administrative assistant who works for a fictional credit card company out in Chicago. And she um, basically lives in an apartment in Chicago and I think in her mid-20s, really. I never put down her exact age, Mm -hmm. but... Do you want to leave it ambiguous or do you want to make a decision on that? For now, I'm going to keep it ambiguous. (laughs) Okay. Um, basically because there would then become the problem of plot holes. Sure. So I'm not going to put in an age yet. <laughs> okay. And you, you feel strongly that you should have no plot holes in your work? Not big ones. <laughs> Small ones are okay because, you know, that leaves interest, you know, for the readers to figure out, you know, device theories for, you know, the things that are left incomplete. But for the large gaps in the structure of a novel, well, I want those filled in. Okay. Because I can't have those left out. Okay. Um, so basically the small excerpt that I was thinking of reading here is it's about four minutes, I think, four, okay. four or five minutes. Cool. And um, it's in the second half of the novel where uh, Regina is finally starting to come to terms with the fact that she hasn't let go of a demon of her past. She basically, from the beginning to this point, has pretty much flat out denied it or thought, you know, I've already gotten past this. You know, I'm an independent woman. I'm making my own decisions. You know, I'm going straight for it. Um, But to be fair, that may not necessarily be the case. Okay. So up until this this point, she was was denying that she had a hang up about something in her past and now she's confronting this. She is just starting to get, you know, into conflict with this. Okay. Okay. So that's basically what this is here. Cool. Um, So here we go. Finally able to relax in her apartment, 
Regina leaned back in her cozy chair and let herself wander in thought. Yet, there was a hole in her heart that was beginning to grow. She turned on the radio and listened to the oldies over a glass of organic grape juice. The young, thoughtful one sipped slowly and gently as the songs of the 60s played. Her mind drifted to the memories of her father. Oh, how she missed him so. She closed her eyes and imagined him in her childhood home at night, filled with multivalent colors of songs, the lyrics of teenage hopes, dreams, loves, and tragedy sounding all around her. Regina sighed and thought, if only I could go back to those times. She listened to each song go by wistfully, then opened her eyes, stood up, looked out the window, watched cars passing by down the road, and then looked up to the skyline. There was something plaintive about the night to Regina, something the beauty of the Chicago skyline on a clear night with its lights could not enlighten and brighten. In those moments, the lovely Regina began to imagine him, the man she adored. Her conscience was telling her how silly she was being, to be more rational and come to her senses. At the same time, she could not so easily dismiss the seductive power of the man in her mind, a man who had opened up to her as she had done to him. Her imagination of him grew stronger until she could make out the details in his face, the man she had lost so long ago. At that moment she heard, you and I travel to the beat of a different drum. Her questions of identity started racing back. The battle with herself began to build. And as the self-interrogation intensified, the untorn lady could feel herself losing the battle. But she kept fighting back. No, don't give in, she thought. Men are just cattle, slaves to rancid desires to the bitter end. Father wasn't like that. My brother isn't like that. And he, he wasn't like that either. The well was building up. And all the torment that had been repressed for so long was coming to her eyes as she heard, Well, don't get me wrong. It's not that I'm knocking. It's just that I am not on the market for a boy who wants to love only me. The rivers began to flow and the streams could not be held back. Poor Regina broke down and curled up into a ball and shouted his name painfully, overwhelmed with the thought of the unfairness of it all, the loneliness that she thought she had overcome. To think that she had put this behind her for her independence, her strength of character, her determination to face the world alone, but no, she realized, she hadn't. The pain was still there, the pain of her separation. I really have clung to him after all this time, haven't I, she thought to herself. Poor young and pensive Regina, what would she do? What would she do? Very nice reference to the song "Different Drum" in there. I like that. Linda Ronstadt. Yeah, yeah. it fits it fits the uh, themes as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So as we have passed the five o'clock hour, here's a brief reminder: you are currently listening to KRUI in Iowa City, eighty nine point seven FM on your radio, and streaming online at KRUI FM. <laughs> we just heard a excerpt by Jonathan Wilson from a novel he's working on. How long do you think this novel is going to be once you're done with it? It's difficult to say because the there are a lot of challenges to reconcile with the second half of the story. Um, so the first story, half of the story, principally has to do with uh, a male character called Everard Di- Diaghilev, who is basically a reclusive person who um, basically has confessed to someone how he feels about a woman and hasn't responded. And the torment of waiting for a response pretty much drives him to the point of insanity. Mm. Um, as far as the outcome of what happens to him, I leave that um, classified for the time <laughs> being. But sure, don't want to give it away. It's not a pretty sight. Mm-hmm. I feel like I recognize the name Diaghilev. Is that, did you take that from it's something? It's Russian, um, but it was just a name that... For me, that had, um, I think, some special meaning for, um, 
I think just the name of the character itself, because I had been reading a lot of Russian literature at the ah, time, I and I think that's how it came up. Everard, I, th- um, I think the ch- reason I had used the first name Everard because of the fact that if you put ENT at the end of his name, it would be ever ardent, ah. which I think kind of fits in the fact that increasingly he becomes more and more passionate and more uh, lovesick, mm-hmm. I think would be the best way to identify that. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so I'd say we've got maybe about 10 to 15 minutes left sure. today. Uh, what I want to do for the rest of our time is a, uh, have a little bit of time for plugs. So if you have events coming up or anything you'd like to let the listeners know about, and then we'll end with uh, another piece of your music. Sure. Um, Well, hopefully um, there will be a performance of one of my works out in Boston in March. Uh, Hasn't been confirmed yet, but we're hoping um, that will take place. Um, That would be for uh, a conference at Boston University. Very nice. Um, So shall we... Um, well, I will say this. If you're interested in finding out more about my work and what I do, um, go to jonathanjawilson.com. That'd be J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-J-A-Wilson.com. Mm-hmm. And Wilson is W-I-L-S-O-N. <laughs> One L. Yes, I'm all about spelling stuff on this show. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a few things I need to plug, and then we will we will discuss another piece of your music. Sure. All right, so there's some shows coming up in Iowa City that I feel the world should know about. Uh, on the 20th, so Tuesday night at 8 p.m. at Gabe's, you can catch a show featuring Hobby Horse, Blue Movies, Father Christmas, and Animander. Apologies if I mispronounced that. Uh, and then the day after that, on Wednesday, 21st, uh, beginning at 3 p.m., this is going to be like an all-day thing, and this event is called The Fourth Foons Giving. Um, the address is somebody's residence, so I won't be reading it on air, but I will put a link to the Facebook event and Facebook events for all of these that I'm going to list in the uh, the episode description for this show. Uh, and the fourth Foons Giving, you can catch bands including Spectral Snake, Lost Gray Cat, Zool, Techno Lincoln, and the Technicolor Union, as well as our good friend Purchase. Uh, also that day the 21st on wednesday if you happen to be in cedar rapids you can catch the band soul sherpa at tailgaters at 8 p.m on black friday the 23rd starting at 11 a.m you can catch the band awful purdies at west music Uh, it looks like they're going to be playing for quite a while they're going to end at 2 p.m so you've got plenty of time to catch some of their set Uh, there is currently a call for scores put out by the university of iowa Society of Composers International Student Chapter. The deadline for this is November 26th, uh, and that's open to all student composers. So any sort of piece of music you'd like to submit, again, I'll put the link in the description for this episode. Uh, And coming up on the 30th, which is next... Uh, We'll just say that the 30th is not too long from now. That's next Friday. Got it. (laughs) Uh, You can catch Alexander Cazares's... uh, M.A. Jazz Recital. He's a bassist. He's got loads of people on that recital with him, including our friend Day Beyer on the violin. Uh, and as I mentioned at the top of today's show, we have an I Hear I See showcase concert coming up on December 1st at 8 p.m. at Trumpet Blossom with performances by Vero Rose Smith, The Demon Possessed, Shakes, Will Yeager, and Annika Kildegard. We will have some of the I Hear I See t-shirts designed by Vera Rose Smith available at this concert for you to examine. (laughs) Uh, And then next week, we're going to have the 50th episode of I Hear I See Radio beginning at 4 p.m., going as long as possible. (laughs) Uh, And I'm going to have as many guests as I can. John, you are invited back if you happen to be in town. All right. Well... (laughs) If I make it back, I will be here. Sweet. So that'll be on the 25th, next Sunday, beginning at 4 p.m. Uh, and if you're listening out there and you want to take part in the festivities celebrating our 50th episode, I would love for you to call in. The phone number for the studio is 319-335-8970. You call sometime between, let's say, 4 and 7. Hopefully I will pick up and we can have a conversation. <laughs> and hopefully I'm going to have at least like five other people in the studio with me. It's going to be a big old cacophony it's gonna be great if you like the show that you heard today and you want to know more about the i hear i see concert series and radio show you can visit our website ihearic.com 
That page has links to our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, iTunes, Google Play, Mixcloud, SoundCloud, and Stitcher profiles. Uh, If you check the description of all of the podcast episodes, you can find links to artist websites and SoundCloud pages and band camps and all that stuff. So if you hear something you like, you can find more. And if you are listening and you have music you'd like us to hear or you have shows or performances coming up that you want us to know about or you want to maybe play on one of our shows or come on this show or you just want to say hi, the best way to reach us is by email. I hear I see at gmail.com. Now for the remainder of the show, let's discuss some more of John's music. Very good. So the other piece of music that we'll listen to here is called Shimmerique. Shimmerique. So Shimmerique is a word from a um, a story that was translated by um, uh, one of the master students who was in the translation department and now is over at the University of Notre Dame, uh, Patricia Hartland. Um, so she did a translation from a French novel by Raphael Confiant called Ravines of Early Morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and the particular story, I was very interested in the word shimmerique and the way of um, using text from that story and text from other stories and interweaving them um, into a kind of coherent form of music that is both improvised and somewhat notated to um, uh, com- convey a marriage of text and music. Okay, so there's some improvisation in this piece? Right, so the ensemble that performed this is the Laptop Orchestra of the University of Iowa. That's great. We are both founding members of the Laptop Orchestra. That's right. I remember <laughs> when we built those speakers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are still around, I think, though maybe they not are still around. in frequent use. <laughs> yes, they're in a little bit more or less, shall we say, infrequent. They are somewhat relics at this point. <laughs> still, you know, for... The composition program we can still call them university treasures yeah we did it <laughs> so we they're did important that. yeah absolutely. uh so what kind of instrumentation was this was it just so, laptops so yes yeah, so it's a the laptop orchestra is for those who are not familiar with what that is it's a laptop ensemble that uses audio equipment microphones um and also audio processing units to um play music with computers as well as music instruments now Mm -hmm. sometimes you may not have music instruments sometimes you do but in this case um, i had musical instruments so i had um actually two different versions of this so we're actually hearing the second version which was played in ann arbor michigan for the midwest composer symposium Mm -hmm. so this instrumentation was for two guitars violin double bass and the a synthesizer called the Bukla Music Easel. Oh, fun. Plus there's yeah. a, na- uh, a narrator. Uh, and was uh, Carlos playing the Bukla? Carlos Toro, yeah. Great, yeah. I've, I've played recordings of him playing that very instrument on this program before. <laughs> yes, uh, or as Carlos would probably say, es muy bueno. <laughs> yes, he would say that. <laughs> so I'm going to let this recording close the show today. So is there anything else you want to say to introduce it? Um, so... I think the important thing to know about Shimmerique is that it's basically in three parts. Um, although there are six subsections, really you can say there are three large sections. Uh, sort of like Lord of the Introduction, Rings. climax, resolution. Um, and for those out there listening, I'm hoping you will um, get a sense of how I found ways to interweave text with music for this piece. Um, and Oh, and were you the narrator for this performance? Correct. Okay, I was cool. the narrator for this as well. Great. All right, so we're going to listen to Shimmerique, composed by Jonathan Wilson, whose voice you heard seconds ago. Uh, and this was performed by the University of Iowa Laptop Orchestra, or to be more official, the Laptop Orchestra at the University of Iowa. Louis. The acronym being Louis. <laughs> and this was a live performance in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hope you enjoy it. Yes, and after this, we're going to take off. So uh, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Thank you for listening. Thank you, John, for joining me in the studio today. Thank you for having me, Justin. I hope we have the opportunity to have you back sometime, because I had a good time. I hope you did, too. I certainly did. All right, so here is Shimmerique. Thank you for listening, everyone. Have a good Thanksgiving, if that's your thing. Flashes lightning of obscurity.
dreams I have at night are almost dressed in all the colors. A woman with purple eyes stood in front of me. A stick in her hand. The stick was the size of the was the size of the eyes. The artist in the nice river. Her hair is fresh and 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 she spoke from beyond in the language, from beyond the grave. If I wanted to be her servant, her horse, there were conditions to meet. Hepany Johns, full of crystal and rum. Discreet, discreet like a man, hiding from a fight. I carefully got out of bed. I walked slowly with my feet of smoke. We were tempted by the nothingness. I told myself, bizarrely, it is this void that attracted me. I floated, I floated like in a stage, like in a stage play, where you get the impression that the actors want to catch a bird, bird and make it unable to escape them. A weird on the wall, the walls without a windows. That I could not My shadow was not in I didn't I have a shadow anymore. My animal shadow. By the night. The water, the wheel, the turn. Some objects to 
guarantee. What memory? One part of them erased. Covered in tiles of spiders floating in the corners. An entire life over. Submerged. A rather empty. Everything that could have been useful to start another life anywhere else. Believe it. This, then, it is. Lance headed pit vipers. Can't get enough of KRUY 89.7 FM? We can't either. Connect with us by searching KRUY 89.7 FM on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Google Plus to stay updated on what's happening every week, from ticket giveaways to live in-studio sessions.